Good evening, everybody. Good evening, good evening. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Jeffrey Smith. I'm the academic dean here at the Stony Brook School, if you're visiting. Um, if you're one of my students, nice to see you again. Hi. Um, we are so pleased here at SBS to um, host Dr. Justin Ariel Bailey tonight for the Staley Lectureship here at the Stony Brook School. Dr. Bailey works at the intersection of Christian theology, culture, and ministry. Having served as a pastor in a number of diverse settings, his work as a professor explores the ways that culture shapes the practice of Christian faith, as well as the ways that Christian faith enables culture care. He holds a PhD in theology, and his research seeks to bridge gaps between church and academy and the formational spaces where they overlap. He is the host of the In All Things podcast and writes regularly for their online journal. His written work has appeared in Christianity Today, The Banner, Fair Forward, and the Reformed Journal, as well as academic publications such as Christian Scholars Review and International Journal of Public Theology. He is the author of two books, Reimagining Pol Apologetics from IVP in 2020 and Interpreting Your World from Baker Academic in 2022. Um, he is also a professor at Dort University in Iowa. We are so grateful for you all to be here and for Dr. Bailey to be here. Please give him your undivided attention. Thank you so much. Well, good evening. Can you hear me okay? So it's such a pleasure to be with you here at Stony Brook. Uh, my dear friend Alex Massad texted me. I think some of you know that name. So I'm going to just shout out the people that he said to say hi to so I can tell him that I did. Tell Eric Johnson, Marissa Smith, and Sean Riley I said hi. Also tell Dan Hickey. We graduated together. Also, if you can go to the Seaport Deli and order a Finca Rooney, it will change your life. <laughs> there it is. Um, like I said, it is good to be with you, especially knowing that a, a dear friend uh, has spent some time here as well. Uh, let me tell you a bit about, well, where is my clicker? A bit about myself. I um, and married to Melissa. We've been married for 20 years. Uh, and uh, my children, Benjamin is 15 and Sophie is 13. I literally just found these pictures just before this to throw up on the slide so uh, you could get a sense of where I'm coming from. And it is a pleasure uh, to get to give this lecture to you today. Um, I'm going to start by talking about a time 20 years ago when I was working at a church uh, as a youth pastor. It was a diverse church. It had um, students from lots of different ethnic backgrounds. It was a Filipino church, uh, and, uh, but it had lots of students from the community. And so it was a really fascinating uh, case study in theology and culture as uh, the students that came from all sorts of different ethnic backgrounds came together in this Filipino church uh, in an urban Chicago environment. They went to all different sorts of school, private, public, home school, uh, Catholic school, um, boarding school, and yet uh, they uh, all were together in this group, and we all shared pop culture uh, at the time. And there was one student whose name was Paul Francisco, and when he gave his life to Christ, uh, he informed me that he wanted to take a drastic step and to destroy all of his secular CDs. These are compact discs, also known as CDs, they had music on them. You would put them in a thing, and it would spin really fast, and they would play music. And he wanted to destroy all of his secular CDs. I don't know where he got that idea, but it made sense to me uh, because there is a long tradition of Christians destroying their devil music after the, a pattern of converted sorcerers who burned their magic books in the book of Acts. And when I was in high school, I remember there was a Pentecostal friend of mine who had broken all of his CDs using a sliding glass door. You know, just broke them one after another. So I had never advocated for such an act of cultural iconoclasm, but I wanted to honor his desire to take some sort of decisive action. And so I drove him to a high bridge and watched as he flung all of his beloved CDs, mostly rap and R&B, into the water below us. How would you feel, well, if you had CDs, doing that with all of your music? And even then, 20 years ago, I remember feeling conflicted about it, and for more reasons than the act of littering that we had committed. Of course, I was happy that he wanted to follow the Lord. But did discipleship, did following Jesus mean 
the replacement of everything that he had previously loved. Is that the way that Christians are meant to relate to culture, to replace it? Two decades later, these questions still drive me. I find myself leading Christian college students in conversations about faith and culture. In one class, I ask them to share a piece of pop culture that has been really meaningful to them. At first, the students are cautious. They're worried that I'm going to judge them for their entertainment choices. But once they feel sure that their choices will be treated with charity, they begin to speak glowingly about the way that pop culture, music, movies, streaming shows helps them cope, the way it creates connections, the way it offers stories to make sense of an otherwise confusing world. This was reinforced to me a few years ago when one of my students tragically passed away, just a few months before graduation. And members of the campus community, we gathered together in an auditorium similar to this one to share memories and to grieve together. And as I listened to the recollections, it struck me how often his friends mentioned his love for Marvel movies, his energy to discuss and debate which movies and characters were the best. What was it about these movies that were important enough to mention repeatedly in such a sacred space? And the point is, is that whatever judgments movie critics might make about the quality of superhero movies in general and whether or not they've gone down recently, or whatever qualms we might have about screens and the attention economy, for this young man and for his friends, these films mattered. They mattered in a formative way as culture, but also I would argue as theology, maybe what we might call cultural theology our deeply felt sense of what is most real, what fills our minds, what we think about, what moves us, what exerts gravity on us, and what matters most. See, I've become convinced that one of the most important things we can do is to take culture, including pop culture, incredibly seriously, to offer generous and generative Christian interpretations of the world and everything in it. That's what I'm trying to do. That's my vocation. I'm trying to give generous and generative interpretations of everything in God's world. Now, that's not easy. It's quite complicated, actually. Humans are terrifyingly creative. Creation is gloriously multifaceted. And so, of course, interpreting culture is going to be really complicated. And that means we should listen to James, who says that we should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because we can't help but interpret the world. All of us must, because we live in it. But we can become more faithful interpreters. And so what does that look like? That's what I'd like to talk to you about this evening. And what I want to offer to you in our time together is a framework for interpreting your world. So here is the map of where we're going. First, I want to talk about two modes of interpretation, interpreting fast and interpreting slow. Then I want to talk about three lenses through which we can look at the world. And then finally, three postures which correspond to the virtues of faith and love and hope. Be about 10 minutes for each one. Let's take the first. Two modes. So psychologists talk about these two modes of processing the world known as system one and system two, or thinking fast and thinking slow, to quote the title of Daniel Kahneman's book. System one is intuitive. It's experiential. It's effortless. It just sort of happens, right? You go with your gut. You have this sort of gut instinct about what something is. That's system one. A system two is deliberative, it's reflective, it's effortful. Take your time. That's system two. And so you sort of have this difference between sprinting and a long distance run. Right? System one is fast, it's intuitive. Split second, system, system two takes a lot of time. 
Now, our brains don't like ambiguity. It unsettles us. And so like a chess engine that's calculating 20 moves in advance, thinking slow takes a lot of energy. And so because of this, because of all the energy it takes to do the system two reflection, we are much more likely to use system one. We lump things together. We label things. We sort them into quick categories to ease the burden on our brain. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it does mean that we have a tendency to jump to conclusions, to make blanket statements, to caricature other people and positions. One study found that upon meeting a new person, the average American takes about three seconds to make a judgment about that person. So I got up here, and within three seconds, you made a judgment of what you thought I was going to be like. Now think about that. That's faster than it takes Usain Bolt to run the 40-yard dash, or Xavier Henry, whoever it is, running the 40-yard dash, before he finishes, you've made a judgment about this new person that you've met. Now that's just what it means to be human, is to try to figure out the world around us as quickly as we can. And we all know that given time, our impressions can change, and additional reflection can shift our judgment. And so some psychologists define emotional intelligence as the ability to integrate these two systems fast and slow. And I think that cultural intelligence, the ability to interpret the world, means a similar integration. It's the result of interpreting fast, developing Christian intuitions, and interpreting slow. Deliberate, slow Christian interpretations. So that's what we want to talk about. Our intuitions and our interpretations. So let's talk really briefly about interpreting fast. Because all of us have particular biases or predispositions or postures towards the world. So business leaders might talk about a bias to action. And what this means is that when we're faced with a decision, we favor action over inaction. Or think of a person who says, whatever happens, I want to think the best of everyone that I meet. I, I want to assume good intent. I want to give them the benefit of the doubt. That's a disposition. Or I once met a pastor who told me that his deep hope was that his congregation's first instinct in any difficult situation would be to pray. Now, all three of these things, a bias to action, a predisposition to give the benefit of the doubt, and an instinct to pray are all examples of system one. Intuitions, gut instincts, postures that then open up space for the more deliberate approach of system two. And this brings me to a word I used just a moment ago, generative. Generative. This word evokes images of fruitfulness, fertile soil, productive possibilities. Christian interpretation should be generative in uniquely Christian ways. Think about what Peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 1. Make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if these, if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now think about these things. Faith, goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, mutual affection, love. Are these qualities markers of system one, interpreting fast, or system two, interpreting slow? And the answer is yes. A bias towards goodness, towards knowledge, towards perseverance leads to these qualities growing slowly in increasing measure. Fruitfulness and generativity and the longer and slower work of making a coherent and faithful life. So what are the sort of interpretive postures, system one, that are necessary to train our longer processes of interpretation? I'm going to come back to that in a moment. But first, let's spend some time in system two. Let's give culture a long and loving look. So in my book, I offer five lenses for interpreting culture. And the five lenses are these, meaning, power, ethics, religion, and aesthetics. Now, I'm happy, by the way, to share these slides if, so that you don't have to feverishly write these down. I can send them to Mr. Smith, and he can send them to you. Um, 
But here, I'm going to put a bunch of content up now. <laughs> so here are the five lenses, right? The five different ways of thinking about the way that culture organizes our world or what culture does. So there's a sense in which culture uh, makes us feel secure. It's a system of meaning that lets us know that we fit. It resonates with us. Culture also might be said as that which organizes the world so that some people have power and others don't. Culture also draws moral lines. It creates a moral community. Think of the, the phrase, on the right side of history. We can't help but make these lines and draw moral communities. Religion, it's this aspect of helping us connect with something larger than ourselves. And it's this thing that elicits our delight and directs our desire. We might also say that each of these lenses answers a question that is carved on our souls, uh, that we are magnetically drawn to again and again and again. Am I securely connected to the world around me? Do I have real choices, or am I at the mercy of greater powers? What does it mean to be a good human? How will I face the anxiety of life and the certainty of death? And how will I live a life that is generative? There's that word again. And beautiful. So the point is that none of these lenses are enough on their own. You have to reckon with power, for example, but power cannot be the only thing that you see. And if you isolate to one lens, you will only see so much. It's like the metaphor of when you have a hammer, everything looks like a, a nail. So interpreting slow compels us to account for as many layers as possible, but five is a lot. So let's just look at three. And I'm going to pick these three. Religion, power, and aesthetics. What does it look like to look at culture through the lens of religion, through the lens of power, and through the lens of aesthetics? Well, let's start with religion. The religious dimension of culture describes, as I said, the way that culture helps us cope and connect to something larger than ourselves. Now, for many of us, traditional religious systems play this role. But increasingly, we find that popular culture begins to take on religious significance. So if people distance themselves from traditional religion, it's not that they don't continue to pursue ritual and community. They just pursue it in other places. So we're about to enter a sacred season, not Holy Week, but March Madness. And so perhaps this can be our case study. March Madness as religion. <laughs> and when I ask students to name something in pop culture that has really mattered to them, about 25% of them will mention being fans of a particular team. They'll tell stories about how watching games or matches with their family has been a ritual experience that they never miss. It's like going to church almost. They even wear their sort of sacred sacred dress, right? Or to eat their ceremonial food, right? And they'll, they'll say, without me prompting them at all, they say, I follow that team religiously. And I stop them and I say, well, tell me, why did you use that adverb, religiously? Why didn't you just say regularly? And they say, well, regularly is accurate, but it doesn't capture it. It doesn't capture quite enough all of this. Because religiosity is connected to regularity, and yet it's not enough to say it. To say we follow a sport or a team religiously signals an additional layer of concern. It's important to me at a level of some depth and consistency. It gives order to my life. It integrates my everyday life. And March Madness casts something like a religious spell over our country because it taps in to the traditional pillars of religion, things like community and ritual. It even offers the experience of ecstasy. Imagine the electricity shared among thousands of people who have just witnessed a game-winning shot, which leads fans, which is short for fanatic, I remind you, to not just scream and shout, but also to embrace total strangers in celebration. It's really fascinating in 2021, I guess it was. I went back to LA where I lived before I moved to Iowa and was there for the one month that they sort of dropped all of the mandates before they put them back up again. 
and I went to a Dodgers game, and it was this really fascinating moment where one of the Dodgers hit a home run, and there was this moment of, what do we do? None of us have touched anyone in 18 months. And immediately, though, the ecstasy, the shared ecstasy of being together overrode all of that, and strangers were hugging and high-fiving and kissing each other and things like that. And, and it, was, it was this, they weren't really kissing each other. It was this amazing just kind of moment of transcendence, uh, of release after everything that uh, they had been through. Um, and psychologists talk about this in terms of um, we watch sporting events with families and friends because when we cheer for a team, we feel connected in a way that goes beyond the ordinary bonds of kinship, right? They're not your brother, they're not your sister, and yet it feels like they are because you're cheering for the same team. In fact, psychologists talk about flipping a hive switch where an experience causes us to feel the euphoria of being caught up in some larger whole, which causes us to sacrifice our self-interest and behave groupishly. And three things have been shown to consistently flip the switch. Traditional religion, the experience of awe in nature, and sports. In other words, sports seems to activate this religious impulse that is hardwired into us, this hunger to connect to something larger than ourselves, something that lasts. We are wired for transcendence. And scripture gives us a clue as to why this might be the case, why we seem wired for transcendence, to connect to something larger, something lasting. We can't help but seek some larger connection because we are responding to eternity in our hearts. What Calvin, John Calvin, called the sense of the divine, a world in which everything is connected, meant to be summed up and held together in Christ. There's something deeply right about this religious impulse, this hunger for connection, this sense that things are connected. The question, of course, is whether these hits of euphoria and connection are enough. Are they enough for us to integrate and inform a full human life? Is cheering for Kansas University sufficient as a religion? Is it sufficient to order our life, our lives together? To change the way we treat our neighbors, much less our enemies? Because although the religious impulse is a response to revelation, we almost always take it the wrong direction. And sports, like many cultural elements, stirs up longings that it cannot itself fulfill. And if we look for it to do that, then we are prone to creating idols, which we literally call the sports people that we root for. And idolatry brings us now into another dimension, one that gets at the breakdown of things, the breakdown of culture, the way that culture organizes the world in the interest of some and at the expense of others. In culture, as in scripture, idolatry always leads to injustice. So if you read the prophetic books, you'll see that anytime you have idolatry, there is injustice. Anytime there is injustice, there's idolatry. Something has been, has been overvalued, asked to carry a weight that it cannot bear. And so noticing injustice and its sources is the province of the power lens, the power dimension of culture. See, culture is a source of meaning. It helps us feel like we fit. But within every culture, there is also a struggle for the center, a struggle over whose meaning matters most and whose perspective is normative, who gets to say the way that things should be. If you've heard of this term, culture wars, that's what we're talking about. So we have power to create culture, we have power to create communities, but because of sin, Christians would say, we also seek power over other people. Now, outside the walls of the church, the power lens is probably the primary lens that is used to interpret the world, and it is an important one. We have to reckon with the way that culture perpetuates imbalances in power. There's this fascinating group of thinkers known as the Frankfurt School. And they were trying to figure out why Marxist revolution didn't occur, at least not as he expected it to. And they argued that whereas Marx believed that religion was the opiate of the people, the sort of drug to keep people numb so they wouldn't take action, it's really now pop culture that has filled that space. Pop culture is the drug. Pop culture is the opiate 
of the people. And so the Frankfurt School would say March Madness is like bread and circus for the Roman Empire, or beer and circus, to quote the name of a book. It's this thing that turns us into consumers of products, distracting us from injustices that exist in our world. And you have culture industries like Apple and Disney that churn out content, media for the masses, movies, television, novels, theme parks, sporting events. And these spectacles are, as I said, the modern version of the Roman Empire's bread and circus, perpetuates ideologies to justify the way that things are. And although these diversions, these spectacles, grant us some sense of escape, it is a relief that fails to make any material difference in the way that we live our everyday lives. Now, we might say that there are both hard and soft versions of this critical lens, this power lens. In the harder versions, there is an active agenda of oppression. And the softer versions, the powers that be, are simply trying to stay in power. They're trying to preserve their own wealth and privilege. But whether they are motivated by malice or greed, the power lens pays attention to how culture tends to organize the world in the interest of some and at the expense of others. So if March Madness offers us a deep experience of connection, we should be suspicious, they say, of the interests that want to commodify that experience of connection. This is the power lens. Now, what should we do with the power lens from a Christian perspective? It's a very tricky subject, very difficult to wade through the uh, diagnoses of what is known as critical theory. And what should Christians do with it? Well, first, I think we have to take it seriously. Because we have an even deeper reason to be suspicious. Our conviction of the pervasiveness of sin. And we also believe in principalities and powers, meaning that we should not be surprised when culture takes us in a direction that is in rebellion to God and the ways of God. We have more reason to be suspicious of what humans do with power. At the same time, we have a deeper reason for hope. Because God has not abandoned his creation to corruption, but keeps showing up amid the longings and losses of people, even within popular culture. And that means that power is not the only lens we use. And that to quote Tolkien, there are other powers at work in the world besides the will of evil. And so even as we seek to name idolatry and resist injustice, we also seek to create spaces that are more God-honoring and humane. We hold out hope for renewal and redemption. The big question that we have to ask about this is how can we take the power critique seriously without power becoming the only thing that we see? We don't want any of these lenses to become the only lens that we use. We have to place them together so that we can see the world in all of its multifaceted glory. Let's go to the third lens here. And this lens is the aesthetic lens. Now, aesthetics has to do with the way that culture delights us and directs our desire. So recently I came across an interview with uh, an actor named Bill Murray, who's in my favorite movie, Groundhog Day, which you should all see. And he was asked to name a piece of art that had made a difference in his life, and so he told this story. He told a story that was really surprising in its vulnerability about a time early in his career when he was living in Chicago as a struggling, starving actor, and a failed audition took him to sort of a dark place so that he actually was considering throwing himself into Lake Michigan. And so he walked that direction, he said, and he passed Chicago's Art Institute and he went inside. He said, I didn't even pay the fee, I just walked in. And as I walked in, I encountered this painting, and the painting was this, The Song of the Lark, which depicts a woman working in a field as the sun rises behind her. And here's how he tells it. I saw the painting that day, and I said, there's a girl who doesn't have a whole lot of prospects, but the sun's coming up anyway, and she's got another chance at it. And I think that gave me some sort of feeling that I, too, am a person and get another chance every day the sun comes up. 
see, whatever the original artist who painted this painting intended, there was something deeply human in the painting, something that connected across time and space and culture and class, and the connection was felt so profoundly that it may have saved Bill Murray's life. Now, the Song of the Lark is part of a series that depicts 19th century peasants working in the fields, so it's ripe for power lens analysis. Similarly, something like March Madness is part of an attention economy that seeks to fill all our free time and space, so we think about nothing else but our bracket and how it's busted. Disordered delight can lead to distraction, and then to addiction, and then to despair but exclusively to focus on the way that culture deforms us, malforms us, misses delight and joy. It misses the aesthetic dimension without which we would feel no resonance. And we need this dimension to be reminded that there is something deeper than power, that there is something deeper than the brokenness, that there is something deeper than the brutality, and that deeper thing is grace. And so there's this layer in our cultural life in which we engage with culture because of the delight that it gives us. See, along with righteousness and peace, joy is one of the supreme marks of the kingdom. Why do we blow bubbles with our kids? Why do we build sandcastles on the beach? Why do we love learning new things? Why do we love the thrill of the game-winning shot at the buzzer? The answer to all these questions is the same, just for the heaven of it. See, writers like Ernst Becker have noted the way that fear of death drives human culture. This is Becker's argument. He says, we make culture either to distract ourselves from the fact that we're going to die, or we try to make something that's going to outlive us, to leave a legacy. But there is something more than that. And if there is something beyond the grave, if death is not the end, as the Christian story claims, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then it should not surprise us to find clues amid human delight of that coming reality. Because there are moments in our joy when we lose sight of death, feeling as if we have escaped the cycles of the earth. It's like we have, for a moment, escaped the ordinary limits of life and begun to taste a bit of the coming kingdom, the world of joy. That's why I say just for the heaven of it, because it anticipates a moment when the door on which we have been knocking all our lives will be open at last, to quote C.S. Lewis. Because if there is a God who can account for all this joy that we find in culture, then we would want to ask how God might show up in the midst of our cultural practices And call them into question, correct them, challenge them, but also complete them. In answer to my opening story, I don't see faith anymore as replacing our cultural practices, but as healing and fulfilling them. Because everything truly human will be healed. Sin will be removed, but everything truly human will be healed. So let us return now to interpreting fast. And I want to, in closing, give you these three intuitions for Christian cultural interpretation to pave the way for the longer and slower work that you are doing here of interpreting slow. Three postures that follow from the theological virtues of faith and love and hope. But I'm going to call them non-reductive curiosity, non-dismissive discernment, and non-anxious presence. I'm an academic. That's what we do. We take faith, love, and hope, and we make them long words. But hopefully this will refresh uh, this a bit. Non-reductive curiosity. Let's start with faith. So we live in a time of diminished attention, of what used to be called the tweet. Is it still called the tweet? Who knows? Of the TikTok where we are trained to just get that dopamine release. And our appetite for instant gratification inclines us always towards oversimplification and reductionism, the attempt to account for the complexity of the world with a single lens of analysis, 
It's all about sex. It's all about power. It can all be explained by, by biology. Just follow the money. See, reductionism of all sorts is tempting because it simplifies. It increases our sense that we are in control. We know we have a, a box to put that in. We have a label to slap on it. We know what it is. But if we start with the conviction that faith is irreducible to human life, it leads us in the opposite direction, away from reductionism. Because all of us, the Christian faith says, must entrust ourselves to someone or something. All of us must put our whole self in, as the Hokey Pokey song says. And reductionism attempts to escape the feeling of vulnerability, the vulnerability of faith, Seeking security in either knowing all the answers or thinking there are no answers. I told my students there are two kinds of people. They don't like to ask any questions. Those who don't think there are any answers and those who think they already have all the answers. And both of these are ways of trying to stay in control. But if faith is irreducible to human life, then it means this, as Walter Brueggemann says, we cannot secure ourselves. We can only be secured by someone who is faithful to us. We cannot secure ourselves. We have to be secured by somebody else being faithful to us. So imagine a child at a playground who knows that her parents are near and she feels because of that this freedom to explore and play because she knows that she is safe. Psychologists talk about this in terms of attachment. A child sense that they have a secure base from which to explore the world and a safe haven to which they can return. And there have been all kinds of studies that have shown this positive correlation between secure attachment to parents or other figures like teachers or mentors and all sorts of other beneficial traits for flourishing, like the ability to tolerate ambiguity or the ability to develop intellectual humility because your security is not found in having all the answers. Or if you've seen the hit, Ted, the hit show Ted Lasso, and you know that Ted lives by a code. Be curious, not judgmental. But we can only really be curious if we know that we are safe, that we are secured by someone who's going to be faithful to us, who gives us a secure base from which to work and a safe haven to which we can return. See, faith is a fundamental posture of trust in one who is faithful. And the Christian faith says this is God. God is the one who gives this to us. A secure base from which to explore the world and a secure haven to which we can return. And if that's the case, we can be patient with complexity. We can be curious, rooted as we are in God's love. And we can move forward in humble confidence, trusting the Holy Spirit to help us interpret the scriptures, but also to interpret the world. But this also means that the further that we go out into foreign spaces of culture, the deeper we need to go in devotion to God. The more thoroughly we need to be rooted and converted to the gospel that tells us that we are safe in him. And if we are safe in him, we can be brave with him. Second, the fruit of love is non-dismissive discernment. We need non-dismissive discernment to accompany our non-reductive curiosity. I'm troubled by the dismissiveness with which many of my fellow Christians approach the world that we have been called to love. I was talking to a student last semester about a controversial subject, and he said, I don't know what it is, but I know I'm against it. <laughs> right, this sort of quick instinct to dismiss without learning about what it is. And the primary posture is suspicion, which is fine as far as it goes. But critiques fall flat when they're just stones thrown from outside the walls. And the tendency that we can have to assume a clinical tone when diagnosing the ills of the larger culture too often obscures the fact that there is a spiritual struggle taking place in individual hearts and within the culture or cultures at large as everyone lives before the face of God. We must be discerning with the complexity, listening carefully, seeking clarity, but love leads us to non-dismissive discernment, the willingness to receive anyone willing in good faith to join the conversation. 
I've been blessed to witness the example of a mentor, Rich Mao. I was just with him last week in California, a longtime president of Fuller Seminary. And I always have marveled at the way that Rich held public conversations with everyone, atheists and Muslims and Mormons, voices that were dismissed many times in the broader evangelical community. And this thing that he would always say with something like this, he says, you know, only Jesus is our judge. So-and-so is not our judge. Marx is not our judge. But we should let him take the witness stand. He'd say it with a smile. We should let him take the witness stand. Let's hear what they have to say. We answer only to our Lord. But let's let these others take the witness stand. And he did this not in spite of his convictions, but because of his convictions. Without surrendering his convictions, he was willing to talk to anyone, listen to anyone, learn from anyone. A model of careful discernment, always in search of clarity and truth. But this meant taking his conversation partners incredibly seriously, especially when they disagreed. And the great temptation in polarizing times is not only to dismiss the opinions of dissenting voices, but to avoid their company. And such a dismissal refuses the challenge of their presence and finds reasons to, dis to discount their contributions. But non-dismissive discernment recognizes the dignity of all who bear God's image. That's everyone. So even if we disagree with the conclusions of others, we must steadfastly refuse to dismiss their dignity. This means relationships marked by creative tension in which gaps in understanding or agreement are crossed by practices of empathy and love. And there may still be occasions where we can't walk together for breaking fellowship, but this is always an extreme measure because we remember the examples of the Lord who welcomes sinners and eats with them. We are the sinners. Finally, if faith leads to non-reductive curiosity and love leads to non-dismissive discernment, hope leads to non-anxious presence. This is a phrase, non-anxious presence, from Rabbi Edwin Friedman. He talks about non-anxious presence as a presence marked not by fear, but by a grounded openness. He says that poorly differentiated individuals don't have a clear sense of who they are, their identity, their calling, and so they quickly absorb the emotions of other people. They become overwhelmed by the weight of it all. And non-anxious presence requires the ability to remain connected to others without absorbing all of the anger, fear, cynicism, or despair. This doesn't mean embracing stoicism or trying to fly above the fray. Rather, it means having a clear sense of your limitations and callings and learning to be present without needing to be in control of how others respond. And perhaps what is most needed in an anxious age is simply the capacity to be present without fear. Not long ago, I was invited by an acquaintance to join him for his denomination's local meeting, which was in Iowa, and I'm not sure why I agreed. The older I get, the more I gravitate to spaces where I know what to expect, where I know I'll be comfortable, I know what will be asked of me, where I have some measure of power, influence, control, and maybe that's true of many of us. But as I sat there feeling all of the awkward, have you ever felt that I don't fit here? Why am I here, right? If you've ever felt that, that awkwardness of being an outsider, I realized that it was really good for me. Being a guest was good for me. It reminded me of what it is like to enter a place where I have little recognition and little power and learn to be present, characterized by openness rather than anxiety. I think this kind of non-anxious joining is the form of hospitality that we see most visibly in the ministry of Jesus. Jesus set few tables of his own. What he usually did was joined others at table, accepted their invitations, shared their food, suffered their judgment. Jesus was never governed by reactive anxiety. The clarity of his mission was guided by the Father's love. The power to be present, free from the need to control or be controlled by the actions of others, is only possible if our hope is rooted in the same soil. And if the gospel is true, then Christians do not need to fear even the most hostile cultural settings. Jesus has come into the world, the gospel says, has lived and died and risen from the dead, 
He has ascended to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit. And until he returns, he calls us to make imperfect models of the good world that is to come. And so every generation needs generative Christian interpretations of the world and everything in it, characterized by non-reductive faith, non-dismissive love, and non-anxious hope. These are the intuitions we need, interpreting fast, to prepare us for the longer and slower and more deliberate work of interpreting slow, looking at life through all of the lenses, seeing in it all its manifold complexity and beauty. Because in the end, the best way to know our interpretation of a biblical text or a cultural trend is not just what we think about it or say about it, but how we live with it, how we live it out in our daily life with others over the course of many years before the face of God. As I tell my students, your interpretation is your life. Thank you so much. So this time we're going to transition over. So I went about five minutes too long. Is that okay? Yeah. So we have, I think, uh, how much time? 20 minutes for questions? 15, 20 minutes for questions? Yeah. So I love, uh, I'm going to use this now. If anybody, anybody has a question, I'd love to uh, have a conversation with you. Yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah, good. Yeah, so the question, they told me to repeat the question so that it, uh, the live stream can hear it. So the basic, the question is, I mentioned that the power lens, uh, we have a tendency to, to only see through that lens. And was that intentional to single that one out or, is, or was it not? It was intentional um, because as, as I mentioned, and anyone who spent time in the wider academy, uh, that, you know, the lens of critical theory is very much centered on power imbalance. And I think it's valuable as a tool. That's what I was trying to say, that as a tool, it's pretty valuable. As a worldview, it's not valuable. Um, it it t can tear things down, but it can't really build. Uh, and so that's what I was trying to say. And part of what I'm trying to do um, is by emplacing the power lens among four other lenses, I'm trying to sort of weaken its hold on us. Uh, so there's two different ways that we can kind of weaken something or pull down an idol, right? We can either do it by cancellation, right? Pulling it down, not ever using it. Or we can do it by complication, right? Adding more voices and more perspectives, telling a fuller story. And so rather than just saying, let's not use the power lens, right? I'm trying to say, let's use it, but let's make sure that we're placing it within this more holistic a a approach that doesn't reduce everything to just oppressors and the oppressed powerful in the week because there's a lot more complexity to culture in that. And so it's an important tool to have to be able to notice the ways that per, uh, imbalances are perpetuated through cultural means. But if that's the only lens you have, yeah, it's the, the whole thing. If you only have a hammer, everything looks like, an, everything looks like a nail. Uh, and I think that's especially the case with the power lens. And so depending on where people fall, I have students who have a hard time even learning to see power and I'm trying to help them see through that lens and then I have students that that's all like they've begun to see it and now that's all they can see and so I'm trying to give an, an approach that takes that lens seriously but that places it within a, a broader context a more holistic context yeah thanks good question others Yeah, please.
Great, yeah. So the question is, I talked about the commodification of sports and whether that's about, and the question is, is that about power or is that really more just about making money off somebody's religious experience? What I was trying to say there when I said there's sort of a hard edge and a soft edge to the power lens, uh, the hard edge is to say there's an active agenda of oppression that's at work, right? There's an active um, almost conspiracy to use these sort of cultural um, phenomena, sports or the movies or streaming or TikTok, something like that, to control people, right? So that's, that's the hard lens. The soft lens is to say, well, it's actually a lot simpler than that. It's, it's more greed than malice, right? And I think that, again, it's complicated. I don't know that I'm going to just pick one or the other because I think in some cases there is a more active agenda. Uh, but a lot of times I think that this, the way that the structures and systems of, of our society are set up is, of course, they're set up so that the people who are in power continue to be in power. It almost sort of runs itself in that sense. And so I think that what you have here in the the biblical language for this would be that there are principalities and powers, right, uh, that cannot be reduced merely to systems, but that do have this sort of spiritual sense, a spirituality that comes out of uh, the system or the institution. And I think that that's where the, the Christian engagement needs to be, is dealing with principalities and powers. I don't know that we necessarily need to be able to always say, well, it's greed or it's malice, in order to say, well, this system, this structure is forming us in a way that is is toxic or is forming us in a way that is antithetical to the way that the gospel calls us to live and calls us to be. It's dehumanizing, right? Um, so that's what I'm trying to say on this side. And then on the other side, I'm trying to say that um, like when a, when a father and son go to a baseball game, there might be all of these massive, powerful entities in play, right? But what the father and son are thinking about is their experience at the baseball game together, right? And that's the, that's the aesthetic lens, right? That's that sense of delight that happens even in the midst of the commodification, even in the midst of the power struggle, even in the midst of um, the powers that are at work in the world. And I want to say, is it possible that God is at work there too in turning the hearts of fathers to children and things like that? So that's what I was trying to say with that. So I'm trying to say yes and, um, yes but, uh, to the commodification, but also to the conspiracy sense of the power lens. Did I answer? The uh -huh. Yeah, I think the interesting one now is um, like TikTok. I think that that's probably a clearer example of something where I mean, I, I teach a class on pop culture, and one of the things I've realized with my students is that there's no longer any shared pop culture that they all share, right? Uh, but what they do all share is the experience of swiping on videos, right, on TikTok. And um, there's a sense that there is this dopamine sort of release that's happening every time that we swipe on a video on TikTok, and that would be a place where you could say, okay, is this about some sort of active agenda of control or oppression, trying to make people stupider, you know, or something like that. Is it just people trying to make money? Uh, is there something redeemable in the midst of it? That, that's where I think uh, that's an interesting case study. I tend to think that, sorry, I, I might alienate half the room here, maybe not even half the room, 75%. I am personally not a fan of TikTok because of the structure of it. I think the structure of it is quite inhumane, um, the way that it sort of tilts us away from thinking slow, right, which I think is really important. But TikTok maybe might be an example of a cultural phenomenon that is like bread and circus, that's sort of you are swiping, 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 or watching the videos go by, and you're not thinking about ways that you're going to constructively contribute to, to justice or um, righteousness in the world. Is that closer? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Oh, is there a script? Is that like the question? Yeah. I don't know about that. I can't weigh in on that one. Yeah. Tom Brady, 10 straight, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Others. Yeah, please. That's a great question. So the question is, for those of you who are, didn't hear it, 
uh, in the way that I described the father and son at the baseball game, is there, a le- is there a correlation between the aesthetic lens and the non-anxious presence? Can you tell me more about what, why you're asking that? That's really perceptive, and that's not a connection I've made before, but I'm really glad you made it, because I think you're absolutely right. Um, this sense of, because the, the aesthetic, the non-anxious presence is rooted in, you look at the world, there's a lot of beauty and there's a lot of brutality, right? Um, now, which one is deeper, right? Is the brutality deeper and the beauty is sort of accidental, or is the beauty really deeper and the brutality is sort of perversion of it, right? That's a question that all of us have to answer, ultimately. Uh, that's a worldview question, right? Which is deeper, beauty or brutality? Are they like a yin and a yang? Is one more primal than the other? And what you said is the reason why we're, at least what I'm inferring from what you're saying, is one of the reasons why we can simply enjoy a beautiful thing, like a, like a baseball game or a football game, uh, is because there's almost this deep conviction that we have that beauty is deeper, right? Uh, which connects to the the aesthetic lens. I think that is that the point that you're you essentially make. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, thank you for that. Brilliant. Yeah, please. Hmm. Yeah, great. Uh, I'm trying to summarize that question. Uh, it's a question about is the reductionism that I was talking about, especially with relationship to science, um, the question is, is that necessarily a will to power or could it also be just human curiosity? Uh, secondarily, what's the relationship of faith and science coexisting? Yeah, great questions. Wow, how much time do you have? Um, that's a fantastic question. Okay, so first of all, um, yes, both. You know, I think that I want to say that um, as a Christian, anytime a person goes into the world to discover it, unfolding the potential, potentiality, they are responding faithfully to the cultural mandate that God gave in Genesis chapter 1. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. You know, this sort of, this sense that or in Proverbs it says, it is the glory of God to hide things and the glory of kings is to, unf- to, to find them, right? So sort of God put all these treasures in the world for us to discover and unfold using our imagination and creativity and curiosity. And so that is good. I think that, that that's part of the scientific impulse. Uh, at the same time, my Christian faith tells me that we're also fallen, right? And so we don't just um, use our imagination and creativity to discover and unfold the world for the good of our neighbor, for the good of this place, we also seek to have power over other people, right? And so you sort of think about the way that um, maybe the person, the the scientist who is really fascinated with uncovering and unfolding, but it's not long before scientific um, innovation can sort of take on a life of its own in the direction of things that are actually pretty um, damaging to people. I've been thinking about this a lot of times just with respect to um, the devices that a lot of us carry around. <laughs> and I sort of think about it sometimes it's like, um, this thing is slowly killing me almost. It's killing my attention span and yet I can't live without it, especially when I travel from Iowa to New York. I'm so glad I have it, right? And yet I feel like the way that it's made itself irreplaceable in my life, it's taken on a life of its own and pulled me away from being present with people. Uh, and so it's not even necessarily either that there is an intentional will to power by the person who programmed the device. They might have been just trying to make the most excellent piece of technology that they could, right? Um, And yet, in human sinfulness, it always gets sort of turned aside. And so that's why I think part of what we're trying to do as Christians is to resist 
uh, and also to continue to renew um, so that we create spaces that are good for humans made in God's image and not just good for machines. Now to the second question um, on the relationship of science and faith, I think that they absolutely can coexist. Um, I think when science is a method of investigation and there is even a necessary reduction that happens as part of the scientific method, right? I think though when it becomes a grand theory of everything or when science seeks to overstep its bounds of what it can, what it can claim, I think that's when, you're tr that's when you run into problems. There is a book um, that I read a few years ago by Carlo Rovelli, Seven Brief Lessons on Physics, and it's really fascinating, um, you know, the first 70 pages, and then the last five pages, he becomes a philosopher of some sort um, and starts making these wild claims about the nature of things that I would say go beyond the realm of, of physics. And I think that's the problem, is, is when um, uh, science sort of tries to do everything in the same way that we talked about critical theory being a good tool but a bad worldview. Uh, so scientism as a worldview, I think it can be really n re overly re reductive of the, the most important and the best things of, in life. Um, so that's what I would, I'd say to your questions. But I'd, I'd love to talk to you more about it afterwards because it's, it's a really good question. Yeah. Yeah. Others? Yeah. Do you want to just, here. <laughs> Sure. Um, I find your postures uh, really interesting and I think helpful for the current moment of certainly how the church is battling these culture wars. Um, yeah, not sure how to frame this exactly, but do you think there's a cultural pessimism among Christians, evangelicals, that is preventing them from, our, or obstacles to having postures of love, even of hope, concerning our culture and you know the feeling I get is that there's just so much that is dismissive um, about our culture and, and hopelessness that is there hope of kind of changing kind of the uh, ecosystem of the church and welcoming different voices or, or stepping out of um, kind of orthodox faith yeah great question I I tend to be really myself, pessimistic in the short run and really optimistic in the long run. And I mean, part of that is because I believe in the resurrection and so I believe that every, everything's going to be okay uh, in the end. But it might get a lot worse before it gets a lot better. Um, that doesn't change what we are called to do and how we're called to live, right? We might lose. I thought, that what you're, I thought that's what you're going to ask actually when you, when you took the microphone. It's like, I like those three postures, but aren't you just basically going to lose if you do that? And, and I think that might happen, right? Like, you might lose, and Christians um, lose all the time, and, uh, and yet, right? Um, our ultimate, the value of our work is not rooted in whether or not we win in the world's eyes. Um, and God reserves the right to take the things we do and raise it up again in ways that we could not have seen or imagined. So we are called to be faithful, uh, and, and part of that faithfulness, I, I think, is to follow the pattern of Christ, um, in the way that we relate to culture. And so I'm really, um, if there's hope, then I think it comes from a couple of different places. I think it comes from artists, um, like Mako, Makoto Fujimura, um, his book Culture Care has been really inspiring for me to talk about the fact that if culture is not a battlefield primarily, but a polluted ecosystem, then the skills of culture care are more important than the skills of culture war. Um, so like if you're gardening, anybody garden? If you're gardening like, killing the weeds is part of what you have to do, but if that was the only job, gardening wouldn't be worth doing, right? Um, it's also planting beautiful things, right? And so the artist's mentality, the, the, the mentality that if any of you are artists, the mentality that the artist brings is, yeah, things are rough, let me create beauty, right? Let me create something that is generative and that opens up space to imagine the world in new ways. So I think that's one of the places that hope that my, my hope comes from is the way that I think there's renewal happening um, from the realm of the arts. And then I think the other space that it comes from, I'm, I'm Filipino-American, and I served in two immigrant churches before I um, yeah, started moving to majority, majority culture um, spaces. And the thing about being a part of an immigrant church is you're used to being on the margins, right? You're used to sort of just making your way and not having power and t building 
small communities of faithfulness. And I have a lot of hope because, um, yeah, the gospel is growing and spreading throughout the global south. There are immigrant communities that are thriving. And um, if majority culture is really struggling with sort of losing their, their grasp that once they had, there's lots of communities that can teach a lot of things in terms of how do you bear witness faithfully without power, right? The black church has been doing that for their entire existence, right? Bearing witness to the gospel with, on the underside of power. And so that's the other place that I think uh, my hope comes from is that there are Christians for all of history who have been willing to fight losing, uh, losing battles in order to be faithful to Christ. And so I think that from the arts and then from immigrant or non, non-majority communities, those are the two places that I think I have hope from. Yep. Five minutes, is that it? When it's said that idolatry always uh, leads to injustice or is overvalued, couldn't idolatry relate to familial values and family in general? Like an example would be back to the son and the dad at the baseball game. Wouldn't you want to live up to your dad being a great upstanding guy and don't you want to follow in his footsteps and be a great father to your children as well? So you're saying if, if, you, if you have that desire that that's idolatry or that it could be idolatry? Yeah. No, great. Um, no, yeah, I think, I mean, I love, I love my wife, I love my children, you know, more, more than almost anything. Um, and uh, is that idolatry? It can be, right? Idolatry is when you put the weight on something that only God can bear. It's uh, when you look to something to give you what only God can give you, and when you give to something, that which belongs to God alone. So that would be the questions I would ask of, you know, if, if you're looking up to your dad or you're looking to your kids. Tim Keller had this thing that he said, you know, if my wife is my savior, so he was married, he just passed away last year, and he, he used to say that if my wife, you know, who he had been married to for so long, he's like, if she is my savior, right, if I look to her to do for me what only Jesus could do, um, and then she dies, who will comfort me when my Savior is in the coffin? Right? And so there's the, the thing about idolatry is it's always the overvaluing of something that maybe you should value, that you should actually value, right? So um, the Proverbs says, a good name is to be valued, right? You should value your reputation. But then pride is where you overvalue it so much that that's all you care about. So I can imagine uh, that a person might create an idol of their family, um, and that's when you're, you're trying to have them do something for you that only God can do. I think the, what you do about that is not to love your family less, but to love God more. Um, and so rather than saying, oh, I'm loving my dad too much, or I'm loving my mom too much, or I'm loving my kids too much, is to say, I want to love God more rather than I want to love them less. Does that make sense? Does it answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, all right, this question might be difficult or I, I don't know if you're going to be able to answer it, but um, is Christianity or faith, um, is that more of thinking God exists or even believing God, uh, Jesus is God and is here for us, or is it more of practicing the morality that Jesus speaks of and applying it to our lives? And then on top of that, is it possible for a person to be a Christian if they are following Jesus's message and applying it to their life? even if they do not directly acknowledge the existence of God? Oh, great question. Wow, how much time do you have? Um, so in, in one sense, it's, it's incredibly simple, but it's also incredibly complicated. So I'll just give you the simple answer uh, first. And the simple answer is that my understanding of Christianity is it is primarily not about a list of things to believe or a list of actions to perform but it is primarily entrusting myself to a person. It's a relationship, right, of love and trust and care. Now, that relationship of love and trust is sustained by certain beliefs that I have about God and the world, 
right? So I don't get to just make up Jesus according to my own imagination. Like I, I look at scripture and see who Jesus is based on the scriptures. And it also leads me to do all sorts of actions. But ultimately, at the end of the day, for me, Christianity is not about primarily believing a list of things or doing a, a list of practices. It's not about just believing in God. It's about entrusting myself wholly to Jesus Christ. Um, in my tradition, we have something called the Heidelberg Catechism. And the first question and answer of it goes like this. What is your only comfort in life and death? What, more, what could be more important than that question, right? What is your comfort in the face of everything that life can give and in the face of everything that death can take away? This is the very first question of the Catechism. And it says, my only comfort is that I am not my own, but belong body and soul and life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head except by the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. And because I belong to him, Christ assures me by his Holy Spirit of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready to live for him from now on. So that has a lot in it of things I believe, and it has this sense I'm willing to live for him, I'm willing to do all the practices and to live as if he exists. But ultimately, Christianity is a relationship of belonging, that I am not my own. I don't belong to myself. I don't get to call the shots in my own life. My life is not my own, it's his. He can do with it what he wants. And there is comfort in that for me, because if uh, my plane crashes tomorrow when I go home, um, or something happens to me, in death I belong to him as well. And in life I belong to him. But it's also a challenge because I'm not my own. So I don't know if that gets to what you're saying, but it is just to say the simple answer is that Christianity is um, about trusting a person, not so much about believing things or doing things. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Bailey, thank you so much for coming. Those tremendous. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, community, thank you so much for coming out. We're so grateful. Um, we'll be around. Dr. Bailey is your chapel speaker tomorrow, so you get to see him again, students. Um, thank you so much for coming, and I hope you have a wonderful night. Thank you.